Hey folks, we have been looking at upgraded questions over the last few weeks. We're gonna close with this final uh, segment on that. And we've talked about what would love do? And love is that thing that absolutely changed the world. And we've talked about the fact that there are different questions that God has brought through in the Bible in different times that have really just cut right through it. Cain, uh, God comes to Cain and says, hey, where's your brother? <laughs> that sort of was the question, right? And he says, am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, actually, that would be what you were supposed to be, but you weren't. And there are questions all along that God uses to come in your life and to actually have you experience, see things, know things, have a fullness in your life that God wants you to get. There's a, a great story where Jesus does this, where there's a lady who was kind of trapped and set up and she got caught right in the middle of the act of adultery. They drag her out, they're gonna stone her. Jesus kind of deals with all the guys and they take off and he looks at the lady and she's on the ground probably uh, mostly naked, laying there, embarrassed, never would have seen this in her life. And he looks at her and he says, where are your accusers? What was he doing? He wanted her to lift up her eyes and to look around. And says, this is what Jesus does in your life. And then he says, you know, you don't have to live that life anymore. And that's exactly what God does to you. He asks you questions. He gets you to think. He wants you to lift up your eyes to see who you really are in him. So we're going to conclude with a, a question today that really is about truth. And I mean, I'm going to poke at you a little bit today so you can be ready for that. But I thought I would frame it in a way where we would look at a little bit of Peter's life because I think this is... This is the big picture of how we have to look at all these questions that God is talking us to us. We said, if you have better questions, you are going to have fewer regret, regrets, and you're going to have a lighter load. And it's kind of what we all want to have in our life, right? We want to have less regret. You know, there are two instances in Peter's life that are kind of defining for him. We talked about one of them earlier, but there is another one where Peter, just right at the beginning, he was called Simon, was fishing. And he had just met Jesus, and Jesus said one of two times where he says, go, you know, throw your nets on the other side. Hey, we haven't caught anything. And then they catch this huge, huge haul of fish. Impossible, that thing that we prayed for, that impossible thing. And they catch this huge haul, and this is what Simon says. He says, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And Simon has a good thing. He has self-awareness. And you and I have to have that to start with. We have to realize, wow, you're God, I'm not. But there's another moment in his life where Jesus asks the crowd a question, and he says, who does the crowd say I am? And they said all these sort of things. But then he looks at him, he says, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that's actually a turning point in his life. Because Jesus at that point says, you're no longer Simon, you are now Peter. See, Simon is the starting point, and it's okay. Yeah, you know what, oh God, I am just not you. But here's the thing, Simon would have never got out of the boat. Simon would have never stood up on Pentecost Sunday and preached and started the whole kingdom of God moving in because Jesus was alive. And Simon would have never See, you know, a man at a gate who said, just give me something and look at him and say, rise up and walk. Whew. Right? I mean, we hear that story so often, but on a mad, down, nothing. And he goes, rise up and walk. See, in you and me, there's a Simon and there's a Peter. Simon is, is good. It's self-awareness. But you know what God really wants you to have? He wants you to have God awareness of who you really are. See, all through the Bible, every prophetic word you've gotten, everything that God sees about you is not Simon. It's Peter. And it's the Peter that God says this all the time. He's in the sense of, I want you to meet the you that I see. Because that's the you that's important. The Simon you, yeah, helpful. The Peter you is actually who you are. 
And I think as we look at the big picture of what we're talking about, God is continually at work showing to you who you really are. And I think you could think of it this way. This really excited me. I said, I'm really looking forward to meeting the guy who God says I really am. Because sometimes I'm kind of back over there. And I think God wants to build an anticipation in you that you can meet the you that God sees. And you can have that, and because that's where he wants you to live. And that's actually who you really are. All right, so that's sort of a big picture on it. And so I want to talk to you today about with a truth question. And uh, you, you saw a little bit of it is, is there a tension that deserves your attention? Is there something happening? It really is a truth question. And, and you'll have to oblige me, some of you who this won't quite work for. But of all, of all the movies that I've seen, this might be my most favorite scene. And, and it's of a general played by Jack. And, and, and Jack knows everything and he's got everything under control and the hotshot young lawyer has a question for him. Take a look. <laughs> Here's my question for you. Can you handle the truth? And I think every one of us has to come to grips with that. That's the truth question. Can you the handle the truth? And I'm not talking out there somewhere. I'm actually talking the inside truth. The truth of those things that there create tension inside of us that we know that there is something that we need to pay attention to. The truth of who we are, the truth of the, the struggles that we have, not the outside polished stuff, the stuff that nobody else knows. And I think the real question is, what are you going to do with that? How do you handle the truth? You, you can kind of deny that it's there. You can rationalize it away. You can self-medicate, buy something, eat something, drink something, you know, do whatever, work yourself down to nothing. But inside of you, there is always that tension that every one of us has. And God actually wants to use that tension. He wants you to explore that tension because that's actually him talking to you to say, I want you to be better than who you are. Knowing that, you are better than who you are. I'm going to give you three ways that you can handle the truth. And it comes out of 1 Timothy 1, verse 18 and 19. Paul is dad talking to Timothy. And, and there's, there is something, there's something deep and tender about this scripture because he says, Timothy, my son... It says, here are my instructions, and, and literally what it is, is this is my charge to you, Timothy. This is, you need to hear this. My boy, this is what I have. This is so important. It says, here are my instructions to you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. There's been truth that you've gotten, Timothy, over your life. May they fight well in the battle, in the Lord's battle. There's going to be something going on that you're going to have to grab a hold of. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their conscience, and as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. So the question is, are you going to be honest with yourself? Because God already knows your stuff, right? As, as neurotic as we can live in our life, God sees everything. In fact, he sees right down to your core motive of why you did all the squirrely things that you did. You can fool all of us. You might even be able to fool your spouse. Mm, kind of doubt it, but you could try. But are you going to be honest with yourself? Because if you're not honest with yourself, you can never be honest with God. And the truth cannot set you free. So here are the three things. The ABCs of handling the truth. If I could get Jack to read these, then they would be perfect. Always face the music because there's a fight. Be a wise person, wise guy, cling to the faith, and cultivate a good conscience. You gotta find out how to keep your conscience clear. The first thing is this. Uh, we always have to learn how to face the truth. Am I being honest with myself? And, and some of you uh, aren't necessarily familiar with uh, North American idioms, face the music. How do I face the music is really, I, it has a whole bunch of, it comes from the 1800s, has a whole bunch of different I'm up, that they think it came from, but really uh, the one that this most likely came from is when a, a soldier got court-martialed, they would play a really slow, unique dirge, and he would have to walk away from the army as they played this music. 
and he had to face the music. And the reason why Paul says to Timothy, you know what, Timothy, that you have to battle is because this is really hard. I don't want to face my music. I just want to turn up the volume. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Right? I, I don't want to look at those things in my life that God is creating some tension in. Or maybe just my own life creates tension because it's, it, it's not actually working. And for most of us, that, that comes that point where we have to say, this is really important. Paul says to Timothy, hey, you know those two guys who are really close to you, Hamanius and Alexander, next verse? He says, those guys actually shipwrecked their faith because they weren't willing to pay attention to the things that needed attention inside. They weren't willing to do that, and they shipwrecked their faith. So what is it that we can do? There's a fight going on, and, and the way I would see it is this, is there is a crazy yet incredibly effective salesman inside every one of you. And he wants to sell you things that you don't need, you don't want, and aren't helpful to yourself. It's Romans 7, the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. Why? Because you listen to the crazy salesman. That salesman rarely tells you to do good stuff. Have you noticed that? Getting you to buy all the things that you actually don't want or need, the things in your relationships, all of those things, there's that salesman that's constantly talking to you and he's making you think about those things. There is an internal tension that rises when that happens and we seem to be, we know that they're wrong, but we are not quite sure. I remember having that feeling, this is sort of a frivolous example, but I, we had our, we've had not over the years, not great, uh, luck with vehicles that are older and transmissions hanging together. I think I have four vehicles that have blown their transmissions. And I, on my fourth one, I was hearing this noise and I'm thinking, ah, oh, I have heard that noise before. And so I quickly got rid of it and told the guy, hey, I think I'm hearing this noise. He's a mechanic, he says, no problem, I'll take care of it. And he says, I, I just want to get a car quick. I want to get over it. I was living in angst. You can feel the tension, right? I just, and, and there's this guy who was selling this car. It looked really good. I went and I talked to him, and I thought, hmm, something's off here. I don't know what it is, but this doesn't seem right. But I was so much in a hurry wanting to get rid of this that I just said yes. And I remember distinctly the moment where I knew that this wasn't right. He handed me the, uh, the bill of sale and, and registration. It was folded up so I wouldn't look at it. And he handed it to me. I thought, oh, I should not. I remember thinking this, I should not take that. But I did, because the salesman was going nuts in my head. And I took it, and I go to register it, and the guy says, oh, you bought a rebuilt car, did you? I went, oh, no, not intentionally. And then I got into like a little front end like thing where somebody kind of backed into me, like just so slight, and literally the whole thing fell apart. And the mechanic said, man, this thing is like held together with duct tape and rubber bands, and it doesn't even have one of those things, alignment things that you're supposed to have, and where did you get this car from? Because I got it from the squirrely salesman in my head. That's where I got this car from. And here's the thing that I want you to know. You actually most of the time know that something's wrong. You can feel it. But you have to choose to acknowledge it and enter in. Most of the time, we choose not to do that. And we just want to turn up the volume, buy something, make myself feel good, and hope that it goes away. It's a terrible strategy, isn't it? When you say it out loud, you realize, wow, that's just stupid. And there we go. You see, there's, a, there's a, one of the guys on staff has a great God story about this. Isaac, do you want to come on out here? Isaac's one of our tech guys, leaders, and he is one of the leaders of Celebrate Recovery. Zach, why don't you tell us a little bit of your story of, of kind of how God worked with you in this area? Yeah, thank, thanks Aubrey for just inviting me to share my story. It just feels really um, humbling and, and powerful. But um, yeah, so my, my parents divorced when I was four and it was really hard uh, for me. It was really quite devastating and um, left us um, financially unstable and uh, there was lots of broken promises. And then 
when I um, turned 13, I was exposed to like drugs and alcohol and pornography, and uh, I, w I felt already very insecure and felt very drawn to those things. And because of that, I, I walked away from my, my, my little bit of faith that I had or whatever, going to church with my mom, and I threw away my Bible. And then in the next, um, like 10 years, I got into deep depression and, and kind of anxiety. And the whole time, I, I, I was blaming my dad for all this. So it was kind of like my dad's fault that I was now addicted to pornography. It was my dad's fault that I tried these things, my dad's fault that I was insecure. Uh, basically, and blaming everybody but myself and going deep into these things. And uh, I, I found myself in this place where I was just desperate and struggling. And then I came to, um, come to know Christ in 2004, and I found a mentor fairly quickly, and he uh, I was one day just railing about my dad's, so all the things that he'd done wrong, blah, 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 blah. And, so you're uh, totally in, like, you're getting this, right? It, even if your story is different, it, it's, it's, I'm going to blame, I'm going to rationalize, I'm going to do whatever. It's all looking outward. None of yeah. it is actually looking inward. Exactly, yep. And, and so then he said, hey, you could have done this 10 years ago. And what he meant was I could have gotten saved 10 years ago. I could have started dealing with my issues 10 years ago. I could have gotten some help 10 years ago. I could have started to process things, could have started to know God. And I'd chosen none of that, right? I'd just chosen to do my own thing, figure my own way, try to find my own way to medicate. And, um, and now I had to face like, oh, I could have done this myself. And I had to choose that, that path for myself. And that was sort own. of the penny drop. Yeah, I really you. was. Okay. So from there, well, how did God take you through? What were some of the things that Yeah, it was, it, was quite, it was quite a journey, and God's still working on it with me to this day, right. but I mean, I'm, I'm so far like, from where I was. But the one main thing was, I was reading the Bible one morning you know, with my coffee and my, my Cheerios, you know, and came across the story of the unmerciful servant. And this story is where this guy owes the king like $10 million, and there's absolutely no way of paying it. Um, and he pleads for mercy, and the king says, okay, sure, I'll let you off the hook. And then he walks out, and his buddy owes him like four or five grand. And he refuses to let the buddy off the hook, and he wants to throw him in jail and treat him poorly. And I really felt God say to me, that's what you're doing, or that's you. And I went, oh. <laughs> and I instantly knew what God meant. I was not forgiving my dad. I was holding him on, on the hook for this you know, large but payable debt. And meanwhile, God had forgiven me of just this astronomical debt. And of course, I just broke down into tears, and I was just this deep kind of sobbing and realizing, wow, I just have held on to this for years. Um, and I, in the moment, I said, okay, okay, God, I forgive him. And then like a week later, God's like, okay, now I want you to love him. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, um, but again, with weeping and through tears, um, I said, okay, all right, I choose to love him. And then working on that. and, and it's, um, a, it's an ongoing process. And it is right? an ongoing yeah. process. But I can say to this day, I, I honestly love the man, right? Nice. Um, which is a huge thing. And, and so that journey, it's, it's, and then what, I think we, the, one of the reasons why I didn't want to forgive him right away was if I forgive him and release all those things, I had no one left to blame. <laughs> I had to take responsibility okay. for myself, and I had to go, okay, now what do I do about it? So I, then I did eventually get into recovery for the addiction. I had people around me to help me with some of the insecurity and God himself. I think what really happened was God became my father, and he became, he wanted to initiate me into the, fa in the manhood and on the fathering that I wanted as a kid that I only saw on TV, he started to provide for me, either just, right. either just in my spirit or with other people in my life who added some small parts of that, and it's, it's, been, it's been quite a, quite a beautiful journey. So. Hey, hey Zach, as, as you, as I've seen you do things, uh, one of the, one of the kind of neat moments is I, these, these uh, Isaac and Larissa are, are both on staff and you know, they'll go, they'll do for lunch and their lunch thing and I'll see Isaac uh, take Larissa's hand and uh, you know, I, I don't take Derek's hand when we're gonna pray or have lunch <laughs> or anything like that, but you know, Isaac takes Larissa's hand and uh, he starts to pray with her and he says these words, dad. And when he says those words, dad, there is something so deep that comes out of this mm -hmm. man because of the story you've just heard. Hey, who's, who is that? What is that? When you, when you say that? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just throwing this That's at you. That's a big, yeah, no, but it's, um, like God has just shown himself to be this, this kind but strong and it needed, like at times needing to be a little stern, but it's with deep love and just um, present and always available to me and um, just, like he's king, but he's so deeply personal and intimate with me and just strong. And, oh, and I love so the personal. Awesome. Yeah. You're a great guy, yeah. Zach. Thanks. I love you. Some of your story is much like that. And I think we need to remind ourselves that the hard work that we do, the facing the truth, 
has those kind of outcomes. God is, is putting us on these paths. He is telling us these things. He's saying, hey, I want you to come to that truth so you can experience what you just heard. The, the father that I never had, I now have a father that I couldn't have imagined. And, and it is, it is it's, it's almost like, it's amazing to hear uh, that man begin to pray and just say, hey, dad. And he would have never got there had he not faced the truth. What is the truth that God has in your life right now? What's that that tension that needs your attention at this moment? You know, in in the scripture, there's a there's a, a juxtaposition of two people that we see in, in David. King David was this amazing king who worshiped, loved God, man after God's own heart. He was anointed to be king. King Saul's chasing him. <laughs> Crazy story, right? Saul ends up of the thousand caves that he could have possibly gone to relieve himself in. He ends up going into the cave where David's hiding. And, and David has such a, 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 um, a strong conscience towards God. He wants to just do what's right, that he doesn't kill him, which he was sort of thinking of doing. He, did, he just cuts his robe, and eventually he goes, oh, that was so bad, I should have never done that because I was dishonoring. i got to trust God more. And he's, David's just this guy. You say, wow, man after God's own heart, David. And, and then over here, you see David later on in his life, and he has a, a few too many wives, problem. And he has kids from, from different wives. And Amnon, who is the crown prince, the oldest. The oldest are a lot of work, right? Let's be honest. And, and he gets this, the oldest one, and, and he has, begins to have an attraction to one of his young sisters who, who just came of age. So she could have been like 13, 14. And he kind of tricks the situation to come in, and he rapes her. And then he pushes her away. And, and this, this woman's life is now over, because that, in that culture, she was done. And David hears this, and this is what the Bible says. David says he was, David was angry and did nothing. I want you to think about that. David was angry, but did nothing. I think he probably did nothing because he was thinking back to you know, in this whole moral area, I had Bathsheba. I had that thing in my life. And I can get really mad, but man, what authority do I actually have to accomplish those, to do what I should do? And then that was the, the shipwrecking of David's life, of his, David's family life. From that moment on, um, his, that's his, the brother, uh, of uh, Tamar, uh, plotted for two years and then basically killed Amnon. Then he tried to take over the, uh, the, the kingship. Got, he got killed himself, and the whole family was just in shambles. In your life, you will have those moments where you will have it whispered in your ear, yeah, but you were this. You did that. And this is why this is so important. I think David got jammed up because he didn't come back to that place to really understand that you and I can understand that when Jesus said he died for it all and it is gone, it means it's done. It means in your life right now, you no longer have to live back there. That that is finished and that's over with, and when God looks at you, that is not what he sees, and so you don't have to see it either. So that inner tension that you're feeling, there's a really good answer to that question. That is gone. Jesus died for it, and I don't let it direct my life anymore. It's my history, but it doesn't set my direction. Why don't you give God a hand for that? There's a tension that needs your attention, am I being honest? The second thing is, we need to be a wise person. Uh, we need to cling to our faith, embrace 
uh, some things. Now, in your life, you're, you've known this if you've been a Christian for a while. You realize that there's a whole flow in the world that's going one way. And the world may look at you as foolish because of how you spend your money, because of the morals that you have, maybe because that you come to church and you're all religious. And the Bible actually comes against that. And if you, especially if you read through Proverbs, it says there are three kinds of people in this world. There are wise people, there are foolish people, and there are evil people. And now because we are like politically correct-ish, uh, we look at that and we go, wow, that seems not right. So my question to you is this, which one are you? Let me give you the answer. Yes, yes, and yes. Right? We are actually all of those things. We're, we're looking to be wise, we are sometimes foolish, and on occasion, we're just downright evil. And what you are looking at in your life is to say, okay, I need to really cling to God because I know that in my life that I can tend downward. Some people don't intend to be foolish or evil. They just sort of make a career of it. And there they are. And in our lives, an unexamined life leads us downward. It doesn't actually lead us upward. Let me take a real, real quick way to look at this to say what it, what it looks like. Um, a wise person sees the truth and adjusts themselves to the truth. That's basically the simple way to what a wise person is. When you get a speeding ticket, you go, okay, I need to slow down. You know what I do when I get a speeding ticket? Wow, I wish that cop could catch a criminal maybe doing something evil <laughs> instead of me. <laughs> right? That's sort of my first thought. Um, you know, and actually, I, I use that example because God kind of got me on this. I, I am, my wife isn't here so I can say this, I'm actually an excellent driver. I can be a tad aggressive on occasion, on many occasions. And so I'm, I, I'm driving, and, and there have been not often, like two or three times that I've got speeding tickets over the last 20 years. And I, and I have learned in the process that God is talking to me in, in my tickets. Let me tell you a story. I, I got a speeding ticket. And I did, yes, I did have the first thought, thank you so much, officer. I smiled, I was very nice, because I think he might see me on TV, and then I, that would look awkward for the church, so. And, and I thought, oh boy, whatever. Deserved it, got it, and I said, okay. Probably I need to just slow down and be careful. A day later, I'm driving in our cul-de-sac area. I was slowing down and kind of being slower, wasn't thinking about it, my mind was on some sort of church thing, and this ball comes across the street and this kid comes and dashes right in front of me. I put on the brakes and I literally stop inches from his head. I think that God allowed me to get a speeding ticket because I needed to slow down because that would have been really bad. See, being wise means even if you don't like it, even if you don't think it's legitimate, you choose to take the truth and you adjust yourself to it. Being foolish, on the other hand, is you take the truth and you adjust it to yourself. And we do this all the time. We do like mental gymnastics and rationalization and we make stuff up that's just insane. Because we don't want to adjust to the truth. And, and here's, I, these are like frivolous examples, but take a look at this. Or you could have moved the clock, right? If you're a plumber, you get this, right? Not very smart. Here's another one. You see that little notch, just like about six inches above? That's actually where the stem is supposed to go. No, I'm gonna take it and just cut it in. And you know what? I mean, these are interesting, but folks, this is exactly what we do in our lives. We jam it in, we make things happen. There's wisdom that comes to us and we say, I'm not gonna to adjust to that, I'm gonna make that adjust to me. And, and this is part of why what Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, you need to fight because there is an inner compulsion in you that doesn't want you to be told what to do. And some of you are better at this, and some of you are terrible at this. You have to learn how to be obedient. And for some of you, it comes more naturally. Others, this is a fight. This is a fight worth fighting. At the end of the day, there's also evil people. 
And this is what the scripture says. Uh, essentially, an evil person is someone who says in his heart there is no God, proclaims folly, spurns a parent's discipline, enjoys evil schemes. They're often called scoffers. And, and you would think, well, you know, I can be foolish, I can be naive, I, I, I'm not necessarily evil, but I think this is where we have to dig a little deeper. I, re I remember early on in my married life, because I would never do it now in my married life. Uh, Eileen said something that was hurtful to me. And I I'm pretty sure I was just being sensitive. I know she didn't intend to do anything, say anything to me that would be hurtful, but I I'm reasonably good verbally. So I loaded up my guns and I shredded her. Just let her have it. And then I went away feeling kind of like not great. I talked to my friend and I said, yeah, you know, we had this discussion and discussion. And you know, I kind of said some things that weren't fantastic. And he was super wise. He looked at me and he said, okay, so she unintentionally hurt you and you decided to hurt her. Yeah, that's what I did. And occasionally do that still. You know what that's called? Other than being human, it's called evil. And we do it. And we hurt each other. And we say things and do things that we know aren't right. But if we are wise, we hear that inner voice and we readjust to the truth. You see, in our lives, we have the choice, evil, foolish, wise. And God is always wanting us to make a way where we can be more obedient. I have this great clip that I wanna show you. You can run it, guys. And, and this is you. These dogs have been told to stay. And in your life, the world is gonna be flowing a certain way and God's gonna say, just wait. Just keep your eyes on me, wait. And everybody's gonna say, ah, you're foolish, but just wait. Wait and be obedient. <laughs> you know, that's the place that God wants to get us to. You and I are on a journey with that. I'm, 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 I got ADHD mostly in life. I'm looking around and I wanna make, I wanna make happen what's supposed to happen. And God's word to say, hey, you know what? If you are wise, stop and wait. And I'm gonna direct you the path you should go. Last thing is this is that we need to cultivate a good conscience. And your conscience is something that you've had since the time you were born. It's basically an internal uh, radar that reflects your values. Before you were a Christian, you had a conscience. And your conscience was tuned to the values that you had. Now that you've become a Christian, the Holy Spirit can use your conscience, like he can use your mind or your emotions or your will, he can use anything else. Your conscience is that safety net. Now, when it's working well, your conscience is great. You know that song, all, you know, and always let your conscience be your guide? Terrible advice, right? Because your conscience is sometimes working well, you fed it, you've gone to church, you're in a small group, you're getting God's word in, you're praying, and, and it's, a, it's a good safety net. And that's why Paul says to let your conscience be clear. I have a friend who said, you show me somebody with a clear conscience, I'll show you somebody with a bad memory. <laughs> Maybe partly true, but there's a good conscience. Paul also says this, is that, that sometimes we get into a struggling conscience. In 1 Corinthians 8, he says, they're talking about their, their big deal was that they had meat offered to idols, and the meat was available for people to eat, and they were kind of figuring out, what do we do with this? And this is what Paul says, but not everyone possesses this knowledge. They haven't kind of gotten some of this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat that food, they think of it as being sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, did you get that? It's defiled. So Paul says, sometimes with our consciences, what we need is some better teaching. We need to understand God's word more because what's an idol? Honestly, it's nothing. Paul says, you know what? If you have a strong conscience, you realize that that's nothing I do. But 
if you're unsure, you can kind of feel the safety net just sort of wobbling a little bit, and you don't want to, you don't want to move forward in the middle of that. So sometimes your conscience needs to be reinforced. It needs some teaching. The third thing that your conscience can be is soiled. And this is what uh, Titus says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and their consciences are corrupted. And what happens is we get holes in the net. And we begin to, we, we kind of go, and we realize, yeah, I can just go through this and I don't feel anything. You know why that is? Because you've created a pathway in your mind and the, your conscience is actually not your Holy Spirit. It's a different thing. It's something that you have to reinforce, say the Holy Spirit can use it. I remember one time, years, decades ago, I was struggling with this thing, and I'm not sure why I did this. This seems so terrible. But I ended up thinking, well, I'm gonna just do a little bit of this and, and see how I feel. I didn't feel anything, so I did a little bit more. I still didn't feel anything. And then I went all the way through, and I was like, I didn't feel anything. Oh, now I feel something, I feel terrible because I know I shouldn't have done that. See, what was happening was my conscience was compromised. There was holes in it, and, and I was just going through. And so you can have a clear conscience, you can have a compromised conscience, you can have confused, and the last one is you can have a seared conscience. And none of us want to get to that place. And seared basically means burned away. Where you do something so often and you give yourself to things so often that you actually don't feel anything that nothing is wrong, and a lot of our society folks functions with a seared conscience. They would have the ability to know what God wants, but they have lived so long that they can't feel it anymore. It's done because your conscience reflects your values, right? And this is what Paul says. He basically hands them over, and, and to the, the uh, two guys, Manius and Alexander, and he says, well, here's what I'm going to do to them. I'm going to hand them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh so their soul is going to be saved. Yeah. <laughs> that seems bad, right? I don't think that's the place we want to get to. Paul says, here's to Timothy. Timothy, I want you to have a clear conscience. I want you to have that early warning system in place so that the truth can come in. So you don't ignore, you explore. I want to end where we started, folks. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I talked about how God wants to get you to see yourself the way he sees you. And I'm going to read a scripture and then I'm going to ask you a question. Psalm 139. Where, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I would take the wings in the morning and fly and dwell in the, or dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will hold me. A few verses later, how precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to try to count them, they would be more than the sands of the sea. And then I awake, and I am still with you. Just in the quietness of this moment right now, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. I want to have a simple question for you. You may have kind of caught this as we were talking. What truth does God want you to face today? Just take a moment, be quiet. You know the context in which he does this. He's your loving father, right? He doesn't want you living in confusion. He wants you living in peace and hope. But there's some tension that needs your attention. Just keep in that attitude of looking to God. 
that there's someone watching online and um, you're actually the father in Isaac's story. You're like that. And uh, that story actually heaped condemnation on you. And, and God would want to say to you right now that you are forgiven. That that, that chapter is now closed and there's a new story that he wants to write for your life. And God can restore things. I want you to receive that right now. Express your joy. Father, I thank you that you are that, that you're dad. You're our king, you're our savior. Um, you're the one who comes and, and, and brings truth to us. And in all of this, when Jesus said to pray, he said, we should say our father. We thank you, Father, that we can come to you like that. Thank you that when we open ourselves up, that there are good things that you have for us. God, I'm amazed at how you see us. It's such a privilege and an honor. Would you help us to see ourselves the way you see us? Just kind of remain in that attitude of worship if you're watching online or you're here. And maybe you've never made that decision to accept Christ, or maybe you have and you've fallen away. If that's you today, nobody looking around, and at home, this is, this is your chance. There's gonna be a little hand popping up, and you can just press on that hand. And if that's you, you say, I need to make that decision. I need to come back. In the room, if there's somebody here today, nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand up? If that's you, and you need to make that decision to do that today. Yeah, I see, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, thank you. I see that hand, that's great. I see that, guys, way to go. Here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna all pray together, and if you raised your hand online or in the room, or you should have, and you know it, I want you to pray this prayer with all your heart. Your church family's gonna be praying with you, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I choose to give him leadership in my life. I thank you that you are a good father. You have good things and your plans for me are to help me see you like I need to see you. I thank you, Lord. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you give the Lord a hand?